Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Launchpad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the commander of the STS-126 mission during uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor's Terminal Countdown Demonstration Test, Commander Ferguson. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out of this beautiful but uh, windy and a little chilly Florida day. Um, I am uh, Commander Chris Ferguson, the, uh, the commander of the mission for uh, STS-126 ULF-2. What I'd like to do is hand off the mic briefly to each of the crew members, allow them to introduce themselves, and then we'll open it up to questions. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Bow. My hometown's Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the pilot for the mission. Hi, good morning. I'm Steve Bowen. I'll be MS-2 and EV-2 for the mission. Good morning. I'm Sandra Magnus. I'm MS-5, but I'm also Flight Engineer 2. I'll be staying on station for probably about four months, and uh, Greg Shamatoff will be coming back in my place. Good morning. I'm Shane Kimbrough from Atlanta, Georgia as well. Um, I'll be EV-3 on the mission. I'm Don Pettit uh, from Sewerton, Oregon. I'm MS-1. Good morning. I'm Heidi Stephanishman Piper, and I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota, so I guess this is a summer day. <laughs> and uh, I'll be uh, MS-4, or MS-3, excuse me, and EV-1 on the mission. Thank you. I would anticipate there won't be too many questions since uh, it's a relatively clean launch flow. Uh, of course, the orbiter has been out here for a, f uh, a few months. It was uh, designated as the, uh, the rescue mission, the STS-400 orbiter for, uh, for the Hubble flight. Of course, since the Hubble flight has been delayed, uh, it's now exclusively devoted to the STS-126 mission. And uh, I'd like to open it up if there are any questions. Hi. Good morning. Uh, my name is James Dean. I'm with Florida today. I uh, just wondered if, if you could talk a little bit about the significance of this delivery of cargo you're making to the station, um, especially for those of you who are going to be spending a long time on the station or have already spent time there. Um, what is it going to mean to you know, be able to expand the crew sizes and, and how different a place will it be when, when you leave than in your past experiences there? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll address one half of that, and then I'd like to hand it off to Sandy. Perhaps uh, since she's going to be living with the hardware we'll be delivering, uh, I'll let her answer the second half. Uh, the ULF-2 mission has been a hallmark mission for, uh, for the space station construction since it will bring the capability for uh, the space station uh, occupants. Uh, it will take us up to six crew full time. I'd like to think of it in terms of uh, we're turning the uh, space station from a uh, uh, a two-bedroom uh, or a three-bedroom, one-bath uh, outpost uh, to a, a five-bedroom, uh, two-bath uh, orbiting laboratory from which we can conduct science for the years to come. Uh, it'll also have a gym, and for the first time, we're actually going to have a small refrigerator. So as far as crew amenities are concerned, uh, I'd like to think that this, uh, this mission is, uh, is uh, extremely important. Uh, not to mention, uh, of course, it brings the, uh, the ability to have uh, the uh, multiple nations represented on board and, uh, and having, performing in addition to the uh, uh, station maintenance, we can also do science on a much regular basis. So uh, I'd like to hand it off to Sandy. Perhaps she's got a few words to offer. Of course, we've been uh, anxious to get to six people, a six-person crew for a very long time, and this mission is the first stepping stone towards that. One of the really neat things that we're going to be setting up, uh, Mike and I, during the course of our stay is the regeneration system for water. As you know, we need to, re we need to be able to regenerate all the wastewater and make it potable and then uh, continue to live off of that. And not only is this important to bring the station to six-person crew capability, but also it's a technology demonstration for technology we'll need to use as we go on to the moon and Mars. So that you can see the station has a, a lot of purposes, a lot of uses. I know Don spent six months there, um, and when we were both there before, it was quite a smaller place, and now we're going up with three new modules, and it's going to be really exciting to see that. And when we get six people up there, I think uh, it's big enough, it still won't feel very crowded, but this will be very exciting. Um, it, it's only been in the last couple of months that, that we learned any detail about your plans for the SARGE repairs for so for the uh, spacewalkers, I guess. Uh, I'm wondering if you know how much time you've had to to practice and and you know what the uh, most challenging aspects of those spacewalks will be. I guess that's my question. Uh, and actually, the last couple of months, that's about as long as uh, we've known about the, or had the the complete details of the repair. We've known about it uh, since the end of last summer when they first started. Um, noticing that there was uh, some erratic current, um, some current draw on the uh, 
the uh, apparatus that controls the SARGE. And since then, they've done a number of spacewalks and trying to assess the damage as best as they can here on the ground and with the limited amount of, uh, of information that can flow from, from orbit. But, uh, you know, in the, in the past year, uh, we've been working with the engineers and coming up with, uh, with a plan, um, had the crews on previous missions go out and test um, some of the concepts, you know, for example, the lubing, the cleaning, and uh, probably in the last uh, three, four months, we've come together with a plan on the starboard sarge, we're going to go out and uh, change out all the trundle bearing assemblies. Uh, one was changed out on the last mission. Um, they removed it uh, last fall, um, brought it back home, got a look at it, and they decided that uh, one of the things they, they want to do is change out all the, all the bearings. And then the bearing surface, the race ring, is we're going to go out and clean it um, and lubricate it, uh, put some brake coat on it, and hopefully with the uh, increased lubrication and the new trundle bearing, um, we can get the Sarge back to the point that uh, it can function um, as it was designed to and they'll be able to fully utilize the uh, arrays on the starboard side. So that repair is going to be spread out over three EVAs and then on the fourth EVA, Steve and Shane are going to go out and do a lubrication on the, star on the port side. Um, and a lot of that is a preventive measure um, that uh, we don't want to end up in the same case on the port side that we have on the starboard side. So they'll go out and do that. and. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get everything back up running. Um, if not fully functional, then, you know, 95% functional. Uh, hi, guys. Bill Hart with CBS, and thanks for coming out in the chilly weather for us. Uh, and look, Heidi, let me follow that up if I could. You know, when we saw these videos on fast EVAs of the, uh, the metal filings and shavings that are all clustered around the, uh, the race, can you just walk through a little bit about how you get that stuff off and don't end up spreading it around? I mean, just how that process works. And when you say 95% back to capable, are you guys hoping to auto track on the starboard side or is it still going to be a case of just positioning it as warranted uh, as time goes on? I've been unclear on that. Thanks. Um, yeah, the debris is a big issue um, because in the past when they've gone up there, it is a lot of very fine particles um, and uh, they get liberated fairly easily just by touching it. And so what we're going up with is uh, we're going to have pre-lubricated wipes, so wipes that have been impregnated with, uh, with the brake coat grease that you can um, pat the, uh, the debris, and, uh, and we're hoping that that's going to contain it. Um, also, some of the, the, uh, the model surfaces, um, they found that scraping works well, and so also applying grease to try to adhere as much of the particles as we can and then scrape it up. Um, and so that's our, that's our cleaning technique. And then once we get it, we get it as much of the particles off, um, we'll be applying another layer of grease to all three of the bearing surfaces um, that are on the outer, on the race ring. And the, the, the uh, intent there is that the, uh, the grease will get spread out with, uh, with the bearings rolling over it. And it'll leave a, a fine layer that'll provide the lubrication. And then any debris that's there um, just gets contained in the grease and gets pushed out to, um, out of the, the bearing surface. And so, um, you know, it's not going to be impeding the, the movement of the bearings. And in terms of auto track on starboard, what the plan is long range? Um, that, uh, I'm not real sure about that. Yeah, of course, the ultimate intent is to go back to auto track. Uh, after, uh, after they lubricate the bearings, they're going to try some direct position maneuvers and assess the vibrations. And uh, we'll see from there whether, uh, whether they can go, uh, go to auto track. But that's the ultimate goal. Thanks. And, and one for you, Commander. Um, when they rotated your tank back in the VAV, there was a clank in the tank, and, uh, which if you follow things like that always makes you wonder what made the clank. What are, what are your thoughts about that? I know they've obviously cleared it, but um, what are your thoughts about it? somebody riding the thing? Thanks. Well, I, I know that uh, Lockheed and uh, USA put together, a, uh, put together a great team of folks who uh, tried to run that completely to ground zero. Uh, of course, there was no smoking gun, so to speak. Uh, what they did is they went and looked at all the crucial areas. They, uh, they x-rayed all the crucial areas, found nothing, uh, and came to the conclusion that if there is anything, that it, it could uh, be taken up by the, uh, by the inlet screens. Um, and, uh, you know, we trust their assessment, their judgment, and uh, we're confident the tank is completely clean. Can, can you just talk a little bit about the training you're doing here, these 
few days at KSC, uh, obviously uh, in terms of the emergency escapes and so forth, stuff that you hope never to need to do, but um, but but how important is it for you to, to get this time in before your launch and, and the, do the dress I do rehearsal? I have had the opportunity to, uh, to see this before, so what I'd like to do is maybe hand that off to someone who hasn't, and uh, how about we start with Eric? Well, the, the training really is very important, you know, for a lot of us, this is, uh, for three of us, actually, it's the first chance to actually get in the vehicle while it's on the pad, kind of see how things are. Obviously, there's differences between the actual equipment and the equipment that we're using here, so it's a, a real good chance for us to take a look at it and really see how, you know, kind of the final details of the things in our, our training process, and let me hand it off to someone else. Uh, I really don't have much more to say than what Eric said, and I'm looking for the opportunity to see how the vehicle actually feels to lay on my back and get my feet up and uh, what, can, what can you really reach, what can you really see, and those sort of details you don't get in the training even back at JSC. And I'll pass it on to Shane since he's the last of us. All right, um, some of the egress training you're talking about, um, yesterday we got to drive the M113, which was uh, a lot of fun, and uh, again, something hope, we hope to never have to actually do for real, but uh, we got that training and I think we're all ready to go if we have to do that. Um, tomorrow we'll go through a mode one egress, so we'll be on the pad strapped in and then have to get out um, and get into slide wire baskets, um, not ride down the rail, but um, go up pretty much through the motions up to that point. So uh, again, like Eric and Steve were saying, for us first timers, it's just a great opportunity to get in the real vehicle on the launch pad and uh, just get more comfortable with our equipment. Yeah, one quick one for me, for Don Pettit, if I could. Uh, Don, going to six people is a, is, a, is a big deal in the station's life, obviously. You're someone who spent some time there. What, what does that mean? What does it mean to get six people up there, from a hap not from a research standpoint so much, but a, a habit habitability standpoint with all the equipment you guys are bringing up, uh, et cetera? How, how is life going to be on the station after, after that gets rolling? Thanks. Well, uh, one thing you have is twice the crew size, which is what station was designed for, and you, you have more hands and bodies in which to get work done. Uh, the other thing it does is it looks at your resupply issues. Can, how do you support six people living and working in space? It's a lot easier to support three. You can use things once and kind of throw them away when you got three people. Well, when you start to get six people, you have to start thinking about uh, reusing your items more than once. Uh, we're going to be reusing our water more than once uh, with the equipment that we're bringing up on this mission. I like to call it the coffee machine. It'll take yesterday's coffee and turn it into today's coffee. And that's, uh, an, essential, uh, that's an essential thing that we need to do uh, if we're going to think about going away from Earth for long periods of time, like setting up a lunar base or, or wandering off to Mars. And, and we're just now trying to shake that kind of technology out by uh, going to a six-person crew and having this kind of equipment uh, and operating it day in and day out uh, just to see how robust that machinery happens to be. Just, just one, one quick follow-up, Don. Uh, do you have any long-term concerns for resupply with six people? I mean, shuttles ending in 2010, uncertainty about commercial vehicles. What, what are your thoughts about that? Thanks. Uh, actually, that kind of transcends. You'd have to talk to a, a logistics person that looks at the, the flow of, of vehicles going up and down. and. And we've got a number of different kinds of vehicles that can serve a station. Uh, currently, we have the shuttle, we have Soyuz, we have Progress, we have ATV, and we're going to have HTV. So uh, I, I like to think that with all these vehicles uh, going up and down, uh, we'll be able to keep the supplies uh, flowing at the needed rate. Uh, you'll really have to talk to the, the guys that look at stowing those things and, uh, and uh, the schedule to, to see how that turns out. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for questions. I uh, will ask the crew to stand by for a photo opportunity before getting them back to training. And if I could ask you to please remove your glasses. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks.